This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector at the London Film Festival, and on this episode, Guillermo del Toro finally brings his version of Pinocchio to life. Yes, I know, I'm a little bit late on this one, but I love the movie so much, I just want to talk about it. Set in fascist Italy post-World War I, Geppetto, voiced by David Bradley, is overwhelmed with grief at the death of his son Carlo, voiced by Gregory Mann, drunkenly hacking down a pine tree which houses Ewan McGregor's Sebastian J. Cricket inside and crafting a boy puppet out of it. A wood spirit, voiced by Tilda Swinton, brings the puppet to life, christening it Pinocchio, also voiced by Mann, and Cricket to be his guide. But Geppetto struggles to connect with the puppet boy, and circus owner Count Volpe, voiced by Christoph Volts and the town's podista, voiced by Ron Perlman, both see ways to exploit Pinocchio for their own ends. Guillermo del Toro has been trying to do his version of Pinocchio for the best part of 15 years, enduring numerous stages of development hell along the way. He was largely inspired by the 2002 illustrations of Gris Grimley, whose drawings inspired many of the character models in the movie, particularly of Pinocchio himself. Del Toro was adamant that it had to be done as a stop motion feature, which threw off a number of studios along the way, but eventually Netflix gave him the budget to actually complete his vision. Del Toro teamed up with director Mark Gustafsson, who has lots of experience in working with prestige directors doing stop motion animated features, as he previously worked with Wes Anderson on Fantastic Mr. Fox. Shadow Machine does the animation for this movie, and they have very prominently credited in the movie's final billing, which is actually really nice to see. Del Toro has been very open about how much the animators have been very directly involved in the project, as well he should be, because they are so integral to the movie. And Carlo Collodi's book has been adapted numerous times before, often quite loosely, the most famous being the 1940s Disney animated film, but in 2022 we had three major Pinocchio projects, including Del Toro's, because we also had the Russian animated feature whose US dub featured a terrible voiceover by Paulie Shaw and Disney going back to their own well once again with Robert Zemeckis and Tom Hanks as Geppetto which of course was terribly received and I personally think that the only reason that that particular project actually exists is because they wanted to beat Del Toro to the punch they wanted to have a project out at the same time but boy, did that kind of backfire on them because everyone pretty much thinks that Del Toro's version is massively superior to that particular remake. And believe me, if it's been a long time waiting for it, it feels like it has been every bit worth the wait. Right from the outset, Del Toro puts his own stamp on the material. It has a wonderfully gothic sensibility about the whole thing, but especially in the sequence where Pinocchio is created. Unlike in many other versions where the creation of the puppet is a flight of fancy on Geppetto's part, here it's an anguished howl of grief from him. Basically, he's completely drunk and decides that he's going to chop down this pine tree that, unbeknownst to him, belongs to Sebastian J. Cricket. And the way that that whole sequence is staged and photographed, it looks like something out of a horror movie. And that's because Del Toro has often compared Pinocchio to being something like Frankenstein, this kind of father-son dynamic, this crater and creation dynamic that's going on all throughout Throughout this entire scene and you've got the kind of crackles of thunder and lightning all throughout and of course it's all portrayed from Sebastian's viewpoint the cricket is watching all of this and he's watching it in horror because that's literally how the scene is being portrayed he's seeing his home being destroyed and being turned into something else before his eyes it's an act of monstrous agonizing pain and somehow 
it ends up coming to life. Even the first encounter between Pinocchio and Geppetto is monstrous when he finds him the following morning, he's afraid of him just like Frankenstein was of his own creation because it's unnatural. It's a thing that shouldn't be. And that's emphasized by the animation. I particularly love the moment where Pinocchio's body goes backwards over his own head. The way that the body moves in the kind of wooden articulation that's kind of disturbing and funny simultaneously. It feels like Pinocchio is figuring out how this moves, but of course it doesn't move like a human body would. And also there's the fact that he's very roughly constructed. Again, he was made in a drunken rage, so he's full of imperfections and everything doesn't quite fit together the way it ought to. So in that way, he does kind of feel like something that is sort of unnaturally put together as if trying to spit in the face of death because that's what Geppetto is trying to do. He's trying in some way to bring his son back. But despite his form and the circumstance of his birth, Pinocchio is just absolutely the embodiment of life. He is full of it. Yes, he's rambunctious. Yes, he doesn't follow instruction and causes a lot of trouble along the way. But also, he's just so excited at being alive. I love the moment where he's just looking around Geppetto's workshop and going, what's this? What's that? He's got a chamber pot on his head at one point. It's so exuberant. And I feel like that's a character that could so easily be incredibly annoying in the wrong hands. But Del Toro absolutely makes sure that you fall in love with Pinocchio. And I think a large part of that is Gregory Mann's voice performance in the movie, which is perfectly pitched, in my opinion. He has the right kind of level for just being this excitable little boy, but because that's what he is. That's what he's meant to represent. But he also manages to make sure that we have sympathy with Pinocchio. He isn't just one level of just sheer exuberance all the time. And what is truly heartbreaking about Pinocchio is that he loves Geppetto unconditionally, right from the absolute very start of the story. The problem isn't really Pinocchio. He's not the one that has to grow in the situation. It's Geppetto. The problem is, every time he looks at the puppet boy, he sees a manifestation of his own pain. Because deep down, he doesn't want Pinocchio. He wants Carlo. He's still holding on to the thing that he's lost. And Pinocchio isn't that. But there is moments where Pinocchio does seem to echo Carlo in some way. He'll say things that Geppetto told Carlo, almost like his spirit somehow came back wrong. But for the most part, Pinocchio is not the same kid. He doesn't have the same temperament. He's not as well behaved as the kid before him. And Geppetto just simply can't reconcile the two. And because of that, he can't give Pinocchio the love that he so desperately wants. He can't reciprocate that properly. He always, in some way, rejects him. And so, in that way, even though Pinocchio doesn't quite understand properly what Geppetto is feeling, there's all this talk about burdens, and Geppetto's burden is, of course, his own bereavement, but Pinocchio can understand that Geppetto doesn't love him in the way that he wants to be loved. And that is truly wrenching. And Geppetto is the one that has the significant arc over the course of the movie. He's the one that realises, almost before it's too late, that actually he needs to love the boy in the same unconditional way as he did Carlo. So you have this really solid emotional investment at the centre of Del Toro's version. Yes, a lot of Pinocchio's stories are inherently about fathers and sons, but I feel like Del Toro manages to find something even richer here. And this is true of a version like Del Toro's, where it feels like he has such an attachment to the material. Yes, we have seen seen Pinocchio told so many times before, 
but he makes it feel fresh. He makes it feel completely different and at times totally unexpected. It felt like to me I was being told this story for the first time. And this is a movie that genuinely plays the entire family because they'll see it in two different ways. Obviously the kids will see it from Pinocchio's eyes, but their parents will see it from Geppetto's viewpoint. And as an older audience member, the film is beautifully poignant. The film is emphatically about life and death and how the latter is the natural order of the former. Everything that lives has to at some point die. And this is a lesson that children have to learn at one point or another, that the beauty of life is ultimately its finiteness, that we will lose the ones we love along the way, and then finally ourselves. But the way the film tells that is gentle and warm, and central to this is the recurring images of pine cones all throughout the movie. They're meant to represent the fullness and maturity of life. In this particular version, when Pinocchio tells a lie, his nose doesn't just grow, it grows out into another pine tree and grows a pine cone at the end of it. In the original book, there's a section where Pinocchio seems to die, but of course he doesn't because he's a wooden puppet. But Del Toro takes that element and massively expands upon it in his version in one of its biggest and wildest swings that I actually think pays off given the themes of the movie. Pinocchio here is functionally an immortal. He dies several times over the course of the narrative, but he comes back to life, but at a cost, because every time that Pinocchio does, he goes down to the afterlife where he encounters these blue rabbits voiced by Tim Blake Nelson playing a card game with each other and death, who explains that every time that he dies, he has to spend more time down in the afterlife. And this establishes that time is finite, it's precious, and cannot be given back. And the cost of it magnifies over time, that separation from the ones that he loves, especially Geppetto, which becomes a literal ticking clock near the end of the movie, where he has to make a crucial choice about how he's going to save him. And so, in that way, it establishes that we have a set limited amount of time with the people that we love, and we don't know how much that is. And it's those moments that we should treasure while we still have the chance. But there's also this idea that Geppetto's pain transcends him, that he has created something that defies the natural order of life and death. And in that way, he has created something that will outlive him as is the fate of almost all parents. Again, you think back to the Frankenstein analogy, who mourns Frankenstein, his monster? Amplifying this theme even further, Del Toro splits the Blue Fairy into two characters, both voiced magnificently by Tilda Swinton as sisters. On the one hand, you've got the wood spirit that fills the traditional role of the Blue Fairy in giving Pinocchio life in the first place, in trying to alleviate Geppetto's pain in his grief, even if she's doing something that she's not supposed to be doing. And then you've got Death, who is not particularly happy at what her sister has done once she meets Pinocchio, but also provides important lessons for him. And these two characters not only provide a yin and yang of life, but also play further into Del Toro's natural fascination with the fantastic and the otherworldly. It's an element that is very uniquely, distinctively Del Toro's. This leads into one of the odder aspects of the movie, in that Pinocchio functions as a Christ metaphor. This is not just because Pinocchio dies and is resurrected several times, although of course that's part of it, but you've also got the fact that when Carlo dies, the last thing that he sees before the bomb falls on him is the statue of Jesus that Geppetto is working on in the church. And later, near the end of the movie, Volpe actually crucifies Pinocchio. And the movie 
definitely seems to be trying to evoke this comparison, but I'm not entirely sure to what end. It's one of those elements, in fact, one of several elements about Del Toro's version, that if you spoke of them out of context, you'd think that this is completely bizarre. Even though I think that there is an element of life and death to the story, I'm not sure if this imagery totally adds up altogether. As usual with Pinocchio adaptations, the cricket is meant to serve as moral compass and guide. Alas, he's not very good at that job. Sebastian serves as the film's narrator, he's a writer, and he starts the film trying to write a book. But not that Pinocchio's, his own. Sebastian is somewhat egocentric, and he doesn't realise that he's not at the centre of this story until his tree is cut down and he's unwittingly made a part of it, becoming Pinocchio's shepherd. In fact, the centre of Pinocchio's chest that has a hole in it that he emerges from was actually Cricket's living quarters. So he has an attachment to Pinocchio, but largely because that used to be where he lived. So Sebastian tries to offer Pinocchio advice over the course of the story, but Pinocchio doesn't listen to it very often, and in fact dismisses him, and it's a running gag through the story that Sebastian actually gets squished all throughout it. That's how he ends up learning a lot of humility over the course of the story, and that's something that's taken from the original source material as well. And there's also a bit of a running gag in that they've cast Ewan McGregor and this is a musical so you keep expecting him to sing and every time he attempts to do so that normally ends in a squishing at some point. Eventually they do actually give him a number mostly over the end credits. However the thing is with this character he has to learn what he actually preaches to Pinocchio. He guides him through the course of the story, but he's actually more helpful to Geppetto. Those characters end up teaming up. I'm not sure if Cricket's arc is as entirely successful as Geppetto's, but certainly there is this continued idea that actually the characters need to learn from Pinocchio rather than the other way around. And this is the thing with Del Toro's version. It doesn't just connect with the themes of the original story, it also criticises and challenges them. Del Toro has been very open in interviews about how he feels that the ultimate message of Pinocchio is one of obedience, one which he disagrees with. He feels that children should actually be questioning of authority. One of the most significant things in this version is that Del Toro updates the setting to post-World War I fascist Italy, which not only evokes earlier elements of Del Toro's filmography, you think of things like The Devil's Backbone or Pan's Labyrinth, which were set in similar eras in Spain, but also is very overtly a commentary on recent history in America, the sort of Trump era and the kind of alarming developments that came out of that. Italy in this movie is a country heading down a dark path, and the people in the movie, particularly in the town in which it's set, are very superstitious and actually quite hostile to Pinocchio initially. And you can see this in the film's two main antagonists that seek to exploit Pinocchio for their own ends, both related to Mussolini's Italy. On the one hand, you've got Volpe, voiced by Christoph Waltz, very much playing to type, who is an amalgamation of several villains from the original Pinocchio story, as indicated by his name, which is the Italian word for fox. He has a mistreated monkey sidekick that he dismissively calls Spazzatura, the Italian word for trash. Sorry, Italians. That character is bizarrely voiced by Kate Blanchett, who is reuniting with Del Toro after Nightmare Alley. Blanchett has very few actual spoken lines of dialogue in the movie. The only time the character speaks is through his puppets, and there's a key moment where the character talks to Pinocchio, but otherwise, Blanchett is actually doing monkey sounds throughout the entirety of the movie. It's a truly odd role to play someone as acclaimed as Blanchett in, but I kind of enjoy the craziness of it. But Volpe wants to make Pinocchio into a stage star and take him on tour, use him as a tool for propaganda, much in the same way as Captain America in his original movie, but, you know, for fascist ends. But Pinocchio very much starts to see through it. He may be a puppet, 
but he doesn't have strings on him and he tries to get out of Volpe's control. And on the other hand, you have the Podesta, voiced by Del Toro Good Luck Charm, Ron Perlman, who looks at Pinocchio and sees the perfect child soldier, one that cannot be killed and made of fine Italian pine, very much instilling his sense of nationalism. He has a son, Candlewick, voiced by Finn Wolfhard, who struggles to live up to the expectations that his father places upon him and becomes a bully. In fact, that's his first interactions with Pinocchio as he dupes the puppet into setting his feet on fire. Again, another reference to the original source material. But over the course of the story, Candlewick and Pinocchio do become friends under the Podesta's brutal training regime. And this is very dark subject matter for a family film to go down. But again, it connects back to the film's message about challenging authority, which is ultimately what Pinocchio does. He realises that this isn't fun and games, that actually he refuses to be a tool as a weapon for the regime. And I've got this far into the review, and I haven't even talked about the animation yet, which is absolutely spellbinding. Del Toro was completely correct in believing that stop motion was the best possible avenue for this film. After all, what better way to tell the story of a puppet than via a medium that is literally puppeteering? This is modern, sophisticated stop motion. Obviously, there's a lot of digital cleanup involved, but at its heart, stop motion is inherently practical. These things had to be built and specially constructed for the film. And so, in that way, the film is absolutely jaw-droppingly detailed. The movie is never less than visually spectacular, and I was completely and totally beguiled by the movie. It transported me in the way that great fantasy and great animation should do. And I really had to give my entire love to all the animators that worked on this film. They've done a lot of hard work and it shows. They really have excelled themselves in this movie. And I do think that it's appropriate that the film is in the medium that it's in because it feels like something that has been made and handcrafted with love and care. Probably because it was every single step of the way. As you can likely tell, I cherish Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Yes, it is absolutely filled with eccentricities, but that is part of its enormous charm. I thought it was wonderful. It was my personal favourite out of all the films that I saw at the festival this year, which is part of the reason why I feel so embarrassed, because I was probably one of the first people to actually see this movie, because it premiered at the BFI London Film Festival. But I've spent months wrestling with trying to review it because I adored the movie so much. I genuinely wondered if I would actually be able to properly articulate just how much I loved it. I genuinely, genuinely adored this film. It is a wonderful, bittersweet and deeply personal ode to the magic of life. You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the colour tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review, and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some of my merch from my T Public page. Or you can carve out a future for me at my Patreon, where you can see my videos early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. Or you can simply like, share, and subscribe. Those all help as well. Until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.